So usually you guys do a little COVID Q&A, right? So I didn't know if anybody had any questions. But one thing I was going to mention um, is that recently the CDC has come out and said that they are likely going to um, either reduce significantly or get rid of altogether the isolation recommendation for um, acute COVID. So I don't know if any of you saw that. But they'll probably do that by April timeframe. Uh, can everybody else hear or... Is, or the, no, everybody else can hear. Maybe just Cecile can't hear. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's kind of new. And I think that that can be jarring for a lot of people to hear. Uh, and so I sort of, you know, wanted to open that up to the group and see what you guys think about, think about that. If you think that's a good idea, not a good idea. Can you repeat that? So the CDC is planning on either getting rid of the isolation recommendation completely for COVID or making it very short, like a day. Right now it's five days. Um, and I wanted to see what all of your opinions were on that. Yeah, Jennifer, yeah. Well, I was just thinking, I mean, it would be one thing if people got paid medical leave and you could count on people being able to stay home. Um, if they end up in isolation, lots of people are going to be made to come back to work at a time when they're contagious, which doesn't seem like a good thing. I mean, the origin of the problem is the lack of paid medical leave, but the problem is real and in the face of people who are vulnerable. Absolutely. Yeah. It definitely, there's definitely a socioeconomic component here for sure. You can go ahead. Hi, I thought um, when I was reading about the COVID and the potential new guidelines that it was 24 hours like after you no longer have symptoms or a fever. Um, Cause I, I think that's really important. If it's just 24 hours from the time you take a test that sounds really dangerous to me. But if it's 24 hours, after you don't have a fever, kind of like, you know, for school and sending your kid to school, it's, oh, they haven't had a fever for 24 hours, they can go back to school, that kind of thing. I think, you know, we're, we're sort of have to get used to living with COVID being in our world. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I bring that, I think it's a good segue. Um, does anybody else have any other, well, let me ask this first. Does anybody else have any other COVID Q&A kind of questions? We are gonna be talking a bit about COVID today because if I'm here, usually we're gonna talk about long COVID or something related to it. Um, but anybody else with anything in relationship to acute COVID? Other than that, there isn't much going on in the news of acute COVID uh, or anything really to relay. You know, the numbers still remain fairly high. I would say they're starting to take a bit of a, a downturn, um, which we normally see, right? There's kind of this area right now in the spring where it tends to get a little bit better, but I would say they're still, it's still pretty high. Um, but other than the CDC changing their recommendations, there isn't much news. Okay. All right. So I was going to talk a little bit about all of the new research that's come out about long COVID, which Janet and I were talking about before everybody got on, how it's almost a full-time job just looking at the new research that comes out every single day regarding long COVID, because there is new stuff um, always emerging. And most of it has to do with sort of the mechanism of long COVID, as you guys have probably all seen, who are looking at these news rails, right, in uh, New York Times. Even if long COVID isn't your whole world, like it is mine, um, you're probably seeing some of these things in the uh, popular newspapers, uh, like New York Times. And, um, you know, there have been a few studies that have come out in the recent past six months that have kind of caused the most stir uh, and, you know, have gotten people a little bit interested in maybe fixing these things or healing these aspects could be helpful. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to bounce around a little bit, which I think is okay. Because if I had to go through all my 177 long COVID slides, you would all be like, nah, I'm done. 
if you actually don't come back. Uh, but don't worry, we're not. This is for the groups that I run um, every Wednesday and Thursday from 5.30 to 6.30, and we do a different topic. So they're all melded in here, but I will make my screen large. So one of them was this uh, immune study looking at long COVID. I don't know if any of you saw this one. It was published in Nature. It's probably one of the most popular ones in the last six months or so. Um, and it really, what came out of it was that they saw that cortisol was very low. Did anybody else see this one? I'm guessing maybe yes, some of you have seen this one. This one was pretty popular. Um, and so what they're able to find was that what people with long COVID had in common and this was 270 people. So, you know, you'll see this pretty commonly in long COVID studies that we're not looking at groups. Most of them aren't thousands of people, um, unless you're looking at one from Recover, uh, which is like the big national study going on right now. Most of the time, they're probably going to be on the lower hundreds. Um, so that's pretty normal. But they were able, just by looking at cortisol, um, to differentiate between people who had long COVID versus the people who were recovered with a 96% uh, efficacy. So this was definitely a difference. And if many of you may or may not know much about cortisol, but cortisol in the body um, is a, produced by the adrenal glands, right? And it sort of gives us energy among other things. Um, but what we should see is that right when you wake up, your cortisol level should be very high. Um, and then as you go throughout the day, as you can see on this nice little chart over here, it goes lower and lower and lower and lower, and lower until, you know, at nighttime where it's basically nearing into zero, right? Getting very, very low while you're sleeping. But what I see a lot in the cortisol testing that I do with my patients with long COVID is that not only, so this study looked at just low cortisol in general, but not only do I see low cortisol when they wake up, awakening cortisol, but I'll also see that they'll have this jump in cortisol at the end of the day, which could speak to why people with long COVID are having a lot of issues with sleep. Um, having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, it's because they're getting that cortisol jump and their body is saying, oh, it's time to be awake, but that's not what's supposed to be happening, right? That cortisol is supposed to be going lower. Um, and in terms of treating cortisol, so if we go to our next slide, so this just talks a little bit about cortisol and all of its functions. This a little bar. Uh, cortisol also suppresses inflammation. Like we talked about, it affects sleep-wake cycles. It controls metabolism too. Um, and it regulates blood sugar and blood pressure. So it's important to know. So when I do cortisol testing, I tend to use saliva-based testing. Uh, and it's really helpful if people have this testing in their house. Um, they usually will send you this little box where they'll do the test at home. Because if you get a serum or a blood cortisol in the middle of the day, it's not going to give you too much information, right? It's good to see, you want to see sort of how it goes throughout the day. Um, and if you have low cortisol, right, like we talked about, you're going to have fatigue. You may also have weight loss, poor appetite, hypertension. But mostly what we're seeing with long COVID is people have significant fatigue. When we're talking about fatigue, we're talking about like a post-exertional malaise, right? A deep fatigue. And so how do we manage that and in integrative medicine? So we do a lot of different things, but one of them that I use a lot are adaptogens. Um, and all of you have probably heard this before, being a part of this wonderful event. Um, but adaptogens are things like ashwagandha, ma uh, maca, ginseng, reishi mushroom is, a, is an adaptogen. Um, and basically adaptogens do what they say in their name, right? They manage that cortisol level throughout the day. Uh, so they're, they're relatively safe uh, as a supplement to take, and we have seen really good results with definitely improving energy um, in patients with long COVID. You can take some of these adaptogens by themselves, and some come as a combination. Ginseng in itself, in particular Chinese ginseng, uh, can be very energizing. So that can be, so if you're feeling kind of really tired right when you wake up, and you're not wanting to do the caffeines, you know, maybe that makes you feel better for a little bit, but you have a crash, something like Chinese ginseng can be really helpful. And you can buy that over the counter at most places. So that's pretty available. Other things that help manage cortisol uh, are basically anything that's going to work on the autonomic nervous system, right? So things like sleep, breath work, movement, um, course, limiting stress, this always comes up in everything, right? But who knows, like, I mean, we all have stress, right? We can limit it as much as we can, but 
it's that it's tough to isolate that factor. Um, other things like acupuncture can be helpful too. But many of these things you can do at home and you're already doing because we do them in AIM all the time, right? Like breath work. Um, some of these things we, you know, kind of practice together as a group on Fridays. So that's helpful. All right, let me see if I have anything about that. So I also wanted to show you this other one, which is this one here. All of you have probably seen the serotonin study. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm so engaged with the world that I'm out of touch with what everybody else is doing. But I feel like serotonin was, I mean, it was published in every known newspaper, um, all the big names, because they thought of it as this like, whoa, serotonin is, is decreasing people with long COVID. Um, and so, you know, like this is this is what we got to do. And so all the because of this study, all of these other studies were initiated to start using SSRIs um, to manage long COVID. Uh, now we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm not the biggest uh, lover of, of SSRIs for sure um, as the answer to this, but and it's a big jump. But this was a pen study, um, so it was a pretty reputable source. Um, and I, you know, the little link is here if you want to check it out, but it was published in Cell. And what they saw was that long COVID was associated with lower circulating serotonin levels. Um, and as you can see here on the right hand side, you see this little chart um, with tryptophan, which makes serotonin. And then you have 5-HTP, right, which is over here. Many, uh, many of these things may sound familiar because they are in supplements, right? So you can get tryptophan in a supplement. You can get 5-HTP in a supplement. Um, and those are all related to serotonin. Um, so what they saw was that the serotonin depletion was driven by um, these interferons, these RNA-mediated interferons. And they're reducing serotonin because they're diminishing this tryptophan that you can see in this picture over here at the right, which makes serotonin, right? So it's diminishing the tryptophan uptake and um, also because of hypercoagulability. Um, so what they also saw was this sort of peripheral serotonin deficiency is going to impair the cognition um, because it has reduced vagal stimulating, uh, signaling, which again goes back to the vagus nerve, right? Um, largely long COVID at its deepest layer is probably a vagus nerve dysfunction, right? Um, which has sort of all these other arms, but a little bit about serotonin. Most of you know it as kind of like a happy hormone, right? Um, and uh, basically it has other roles as well, though. It, it helps with learning, memory, um, it also regulates body temperature, sleep, um, hunger. Serotonin is really important for hunger. And most of it is found in the gut, which is why when people start taking things like SSRI, they'll, SSRIs like um, Zoloft is an example of an SSRI or Prozac, they may feel like some gut upset initially um, because it's really stimulating those receptors. And it's, it's made from tryptophan, which is an amino acid. Um, so let's go to the next one. This is actually interesting. We'll stay on this for one for a minute because it's also important to know that too much serotonin in the gut can actually lead to osteoporosis. It actually has an impact on bone density. So all these are all the things that can happen supposedly from low serotonin, but let's get to this one because I think this is important. How do we increase our tryptophan, ultimately increasing our serotonin without taking something like a pharmaceutical, right? That's gonna have other side effects. Um, and that's what some of these things on the list can do. So eating foods um, that are high in tryptophan, things like salmon, eggs, cheese, turkey. Many of you probably know that uh, with Thanksgiving, right? They say like, oh, I had too much tryptophan from the turkey, like they ate so much turkey. You can also find it in a, in a supplement too. Um, but these are just some foods you could add into your diet. Other things like that ginseng we talked about, you could kind of get almost two things for one, right? If you have a lot of fatigue during the day after your COVID infection, and you um, you also think, well, maybe it's related to the serotonin thing that came out in the study, you could take ginseng and it would cover both um, the cortisol and the serotonin and would be relatively safe. So ginseng is definitely a good option. St. John's wort, you have to be careful with because St. John's wort um, does interact with pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, like those SSRIs that I talked about earlier. So you don't want to take too much St. John's wort um, without looking at your medications to make sure it's okay. 
probiotics are very important. All of you know by now, if you've been a part of AIM, that the gut is extremely important. The microbiome of the gut is really important. So if your microbiome is dysbiotic or not healthy, it's going to lead to illness. Um, so making sure that that gut microbiome is healthy can be really important using things like probiotics. And then there's also a supplement called SAMI. Um, and this supplement can also increase serotonin too. There's other natural ways outside of uh, food and supplements. Uh, and this is a lot of what we've already heard, but things like exercise, sunlight, yoga, massage, acupuncture, uh, some of those wonderful things that we kind of do at the end of, um, of these meetings. So, hold on, let me go back. Oh, it's also important, I'll, I'll do this slide too, because this is important to mention. So it's also important to mention that there was one study that looked at fluvoxamine in particular, um, and this is considered an SSRI, but it's unique as an SSRI because it's a sigma-1 receptor agonist. Um, and so it is thought that it can actually inhibit, inhibit replication of COVID-19 um, and, and reduce neuroinflammation. So what they saw was that it definitely uh, lowered the risk of long COVID and, and hospitalization in this one study. So there's lots coming out for sure. And then we'll do one more and I'll let you guys do your wonderful practice. Let's do this one. And then if you're interested in more long COVID stuff, you can always reach out to me. I got plenty of long COVID information to provide. <laughs> um, so another research update in the last six months or so was this one in Nature Immunology, which looked at inflammation and severe COVID being linked to bad fungal microbiomes. So that's pretty important. So we talk a lot about the gut microbiome, but we don't talk a lot about the gut mycobiota, which is sort of the fungus in the gut. Um, so we should have some yeast. It's like, it's not that yeast shouldn't exist in the gut at all. There is some healthy yeast in the gut. Uh, but what we're seeing with long COVID is that there could be an overgrowth or an unhealthy amount of yeast in the gut. Um, and that this fungal portion is interacting with the immune system, which could be a, a very significant component of long COVID. Um, so there was a study that was at Cornell, and it looked at hospitalized severe COVID patients. And um, people who were in the hospital with severe infections were four, had four times as many antibodies against fungal species as people who um, were outside of the hospital. So clearly, there's sort of maybe this relationship between having a severe infection and maybe having a fungal overgrowth in the gut. Um, they looked at fecal samples in 2021, um, which showed that there was high candida in COVID patients as well. Uh, and so what they were seeing was that this, this fungus in the gut is really activating the immune system. It's keeping that prolonged response, which is what we see in long COVID, is that there's this prolonged inflammatory immune system response that really never dies down when it should. Um, and they also did, they also, you know, took the information that they found and used mice in a study uh, to look specifically at how um, when mice had that COVID infection, when it was more severe, those mice actually had higher fungal levels and they treated them with antifungals and they improved. Um, and they also saw that the, if they went untreated, that these fungal levels in the gut continued to be elevated after a year. So that could definitely be a part of sort of like the long, um, you know, sort of the, the lingering chronicity of the symptoms. Oh, oh yeah, EBV and long COVID. We can definitely talk about that. So I don't know, I may have a slide or may not, but in the effort of time, I can just talk about the cuff about sort of Epstein-Barr virus and long COVID. So there definitely is a correlation between long COVID and activated or reactivated viruses, right? So it's been shown that in people who have long COVID, many of them also have what they consider a reactivated uh, infection that is from their past, right? Um, and Epstein-Barr virus is mono, for those of you that may not know. And uh, mono is something that most younger people get around maybe in their 20s. The thing is, too, that you may be somebody who 
doesn't know um, that they even had it in the past, right? You didn't even know that you had uh, mono in the past, but there definitely is a relationship. But I often wonder if that relationship really has to do with the fact that the immune system is in such a dysfunctional state that it can't keep that virus in latency any longer because we also see a lot of shingles after COVID with, and with people with long COVID as well. So that is something to kind of think about is um, really if we improve on a deeper level, their immune system function, we'll probably be able to put those viruses back into latency and they'll function very well. Um, I do, you know, there has been, there's very limited information about using antivirals uh, to help with that. And from what we've seen, there hasn't been these huge changes in my patients who have kind of gone that route of trying an antiviral to see if it would help. It's really about um, helping that oxidative stress, that inflammation on a cellular level that, that helps it. I think we got another question too. Um, Oh, for somebody who has gut fungal and candida overgrowth long COVID, is there a protocol? So there are a lot of different supplements that you can use for um, candida. And some of them, I'll put some of them in the chat. That can be helpful. The only thing is that if you, you probably have to get it retested to see. There's also just the antifungals that they use in conventional medicine, right? But those can be really harsh uh, and they're not my favorite. So I can, but I can definitely give you some uh, information about that. Let's see. So I tend to use Candida Stat, and I also use Candida Bactin. So I'll write those here. These are two supplements I use a lot for fungal overgrowth. So natural ways, um, besides using sort of supplements or herbs that could help uh, reduce fungal overgrowth would be changing the diet, really. The candida diet is is pretty intense, I won't lie. <laughs> so if you truly have this very significant overgrowth of fungus in your gut, you're going to have to get rid of, I mean, pretty much all sugar. And when I mean like all sugar, I mean like fruit sugar. <laughs> it, it's crazy the amount of carbohydrates you really have to reduce. Now, in reality, when I speak with my patients and I tell them how they should eat for their fungus, I usually tell them they can have some carbohydrates because I really don't like to get rid of those all completely in the diet. Um, although I will say it's it's a very long process to cure a gut fungal infection. It's, it's not quick, right? It takes time, but everything in the microbiome or mycobiome takes a significant amount of time. So don't be deterred if you've had it for a while and you're kind of working through it. Um, it, it does take time, but sugar is one of the biggest dairy, right? Um, also, and then I have this one, I'll show you this one slide too, that has all the foods on it. Here you go. So this slide has all the foods, the foods that kill yeast and the foods that feed the yeast, things like bear and wine, right? Dried fruit, what a bummer. Some dried food is so good, gluten, fermented foods, beans, the things that like seem like they could be good for you and usually are, but they can feed yeast. And then there's some other stuff that kills yeast, um, like cruciferous vegetables or ginger, or cinnamon, um, garlic, all those things kill yeast. So there are lots of IV treatments that you can explore. Most of those are going to increase your overall antioxidants um, to build up and reduce the amount of oxidative stress. Uh, not anything for like a fungus infection. Um, uh, EBV to MS. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. All autoimmune conditions can be triggered by a virus for sure. Um, how complex and how common is cortisol testing? So um, it's not super complex. It's a salivary test. It tends to be a functional test, so it does cost some money, um, but it's, it's pretty common. Can we get these slides? Yeah, I can send um, Janet my slides. There's a lot of them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but so I can't send them like as individual, but I'll, I'll send them all and you guys can look through them. Some of it may make sense and some of it may not. I'll put it in a shared folder. So if you want to send the yeah, long yeah. version, 
and the short version, I can include both of those. Okay. Okay. Um, just don't share it outside of, of this. Um, here's the article. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, Dutch, Dutch is good, but Dutch is a bigger test and it's an expensive task. So we use Dutch a lot when we want to look at sex hormones, things like progesterone, um, estrogen in combination with cortisol, but there are just tests that look at like ZRT makes a test, um, like a ZRT cortisol test. They make ones that are just the cortisol. So you'll end up saving some money if you're just looking at that and you're kind of not interested in your estrogen progesterone levels. Um, although I will say, and speaking towards that, there has been some studies that show that um, lower estrogen may also be a, a cause of long, long COVID too. Okay, so Janet will help you probably, I'm sure, find out about how to get in touch with the shared folder. I'm not sure. <laughs> you send it out to everybody, Janet. Is that how it works or... Uh, yes, I send a post um, of an email that will include all the links from that uh, everybody's put in the meeting chat and um, the shared folder and a few other things. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, then, if nobody has any other questions, I'll leave you to your great mindfulness experience. Um, but it was so good to be with all of you. It always is so good to be with all of you. <laughs> the longest long COVID. <laughs> okay. Hi, Amin. Thanks for coming. And I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. Excellent. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so my name is Amin. I am a certified heart math trainer. I lead um, heart-focused meditative practices. I'm also a certified yoga nidra teacher. And uh, after speaking with uh, Janet and having done a few of these, uh, leaning in to the heart math techniques, today I decided to bring in yoga nidra. Yoga nidra, just like heart math, also has a lot of... Um, evidence that shows its effectiveness. Uh, the basic uh, way to describe it is yogic sleep is how they call it. It's a guided meditation that comes out of this yoga tradition that helps people to relax, calm, settle the body and allow the fullness of the, you know, the beings that we are to be present. So, and normally it's done lying down. It can also be done, you know, if you're in a comfortable seat, sitting somewhere, just make sure you don't have anything distracting you. And at any given time, you know, if you need to open your eyes and take care of uh, your surroundings, um, we always encourage that you do that. So with that in mind, I am ready to start us on this journey. Okay. So find yourself a comfortable place. See yourself somewhere where you won't be disturbed. And just close your eyes. Bring your awareness to your breath. Just be still. Let go of all thoughts, worry, and tension. Relax. Trust and let go. You breathe in fully and exhale with a deep, deep sigh. And again, breathe in fully and exhale with a deep sigh. And let go even more. And feel a deep sense of contentment and peace in your heart. Bring your body into awareness. Become aware that your body has been a trusted vehicle for you, helping you create accomplishments and contributions to the best of its ability. Now it's time for your body to rest deeply.
maintaining this inner awareness and unfolding stillness, just gently bring your palms together and rub them together gently, ever so gently, no effort. Now place your palms on your face with the fingertips covering your eyelids and the rest of the palm covering the entire face. Make sure you leave room so that you can continue breathing and not covering your nose and nostril. Gently letting your palms rest on your face. And if you feel, just massage your face gently up to the hairline maybe and just around the temples, the jaws. Maybe massage the ears around the earlobes, gently pulling on your earlobes and massaging your neck. And just let your hands now just rest back by your sides. Your eyes stay closed. And drop all expressions from the face. Take a deep, deep breath in. And let go. Take another deep, deep breath in and let go even more. Release your arms to your sides completely. And feel this impact of all that relaxation, flooding your whole body, your entire being, bathing in the sensations that are arising in your body. Feel yourself descending down into that stillness, a stillness that is naturally there beneath the murmurs of the mind and the thoughts. As you enter the deepest state of letting go right now, feel your outward attention moving inward. Just let your attention lead you in complete and total absorption. Feel into that sense of deep stillness that's expanding everywhere. As we enter this next phase, remain as motionly as possible. If you need to move or make an adjustment, do so mindfully and return to stillness as soon as you're able. And resolve to remain awake, stay in touch with the sound of my voice. And allow your entire body to respond to my words. Allow any disturbances, external or internal, to draw you 
even more deeply within. Let your mind merge and melt the energy field that surrounds your body and that goes beyond the boundaries of the body and mind as you find yourself shifting from thinking and doing to feeling and being. Do absolutely nothing from now on. Simply relax and drop into the deepest state of tranquility, stillness, and peace in the space between your eyebrows, deep in your brain. Knowing full well your consciousness is still present and in direct communion with your body and the energy field. Now, direct your full attention to your breath. Just noticing you're not creating any struggle around breathing. Just observing the breath. Now we're going to use the breath to release any residual tensions in the body. And so slowly deepen your inhalations and exhalations. Just let your breath flow in. Allow it to be steady, uniform, unbroken stream. Without exerting any effort or force, just allow that natural deep inhalations followed by deep exhalations. Continue until I ask you to stop. In the meantime, let your attention be totally connected to your breath as it flows in and out. Bring all of your attention to the expansion and contraction of your abdomen as you breathe deeply in and out. And with each exhalation, just allow for the release of all the residual tensions held in the body to let go. Breathe out any tension in the body. Use your breath to progressively enter a deeper level of stillness, of silence. You continue with a few more slow, deep breaths. And 
who will count for 10 slow breaths and you count them like this 10 i am breathing in 10 i'm breathing out nine i'm breathing in nine i am breathing out eight i'm breathing in eight i am breathing out Continue your own pace. Be completely absorbed in the sound of your own breath. Let yourself be more relaxed and peaceful with each breath. Now allow your breath to return to normal. Feel the energetic impact of the breath in the form of pulsations in the body. Your attention allows the energy field in the body to grow and expand all around it. Feel that sensation, experience that. The energy flows attention. Just let your mind melt and merge in the river of energy flowing through your body and all around it. Drop into that silent space where all doing stops. Let go, let go even more. Now follow my guidance. We go through the different parts of the body, bringing more and more relaxation to each part. Let your attention rest on each body part or organ I name. And let the awareness of this rest without any comment or judgment. All 10 toes, both ankles, both knees, the pelvis, the chest, the shoulders, the arms, the throat, chin, the face, Back of the head, the shoulder blades, the back, the hips, the calves, heels, soles of the feet. Now sense the whole body 
from the top of the head to the tips of the toes, your whole body. Feeling the whole body contained in vast, spacious awareness. Now to even drop deeper into the body. As I name the body part, bring it to total attention, accompanied by a feeling of heaviness sinking like a stone in water. Both feet heavy like stones. Calves and knees heavy sinking deeper. Thighs and hips, very heavy, like lead. Abdomen, chest and back, feel the gravity pulling you down deeper. Shoulders, arms and palms, very, very heavy. Feel your entire head heavy like a stone. And rest your body completely and totally to the omnipresent field of gravity. Now experience your whole body heavy like a rock. Feel your whole body sinking deeper and deeper. Totally let go into the pool of gravity, sinking, sinking heavy like a stone. Sinking deeper into stillness and silent awareness. And now shift your attention and bring a sense of warmth to your whole body as if you're sitting in front of a fire. Both feet warm, dry. Both knees glowing with heat from the closeness to the fire. Thighs and hips warm, toasty. Abdomen chest and back, radiating heat. Shoulders, arms and palms, heavy, throbbing with heat. The whole body, warm, radiating. Now, press back in neutral awareness, a witness the whole body held in absolute stillness. Resting in witness consciousness, allow yourself to receive the following images and experiences. Judge nothing. Remain unconditionally open and present to all that passes in the field of your awareness. A swan gliding on a placid lake. Sunset on the beach. A pink rose. Ocean waves. Butterflies. And now be still in that spacious awareness behind the forehead and observe what passes. 
witnessing and attached to all that passes. And if nothing appears, just be aware of that. Be totally present, completely absorbed. In this domain of stillness and integration, you are witnessing all that is happening, but you're doing nothing to make it happen. Let your mind merge and melt into the present moment as you enter the sanctuary of silence, stillness. Allow your breath to be just as present, now gaining more awareness of your breathing. Allow your awareness to naturally come back into the room and the space you see it. your body for taking this moment to rest allowing your mind to be fully present and drop in and become aware of the outlines of your body abs seat that you're sitting on wiggle your toes and fingers Gently move your hands and arms and feet and legs. Just bring yourself slowly back into your body and feel your body with your hands. 
your eyes are closed, you can gently bring yourself back, letting your eyes flood or open very gently, easy. Open back. I don't know about you guys, but I am very relaxed right now. I'm switching over to my headset. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, I mean, for coming and sharing your time with us and your practice. Thank you. Well, Dr. Kogan is hopefully skiing in the Alps, from what I understand. So let's all wish him and his family well during his 50th uh, birthday celebration. And I wish everyone a wonderful weekend. Take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.